I am in a little town called Three Rivers, California, and this little town is at the foot of the Sequoia National Forest. Oh, and I am here with my uh, wife, Julie, and our son, Oliver. And uh, we came up here, we left LA about, uh, well, Julie's been here for about three weeks. I've been here for two weeks. And we're planning on just staying here until things calm down because it's a safer place to be. That sounds great. Well, as I mentioned to you, we're, we com compiled a series of very open-ended questions. And um, with your permission, I'll begin. Yes, absolutely. First question is, what is your most vivid memory from childhood? Mm. My most vivid memory from childhood, gosh. Going way back. That's a hard one because there's so many memories from your childhood, like they all combine together. But I think that it would be the sense of freedom in the summer, riding a bike, trying to ride it without your mouth being open because otherwise bugs hit your go into your mouth, and uh, singing at the top of my lungs as I was just riding down the streets past all the cornfields. So I really, really like spending the entire summer pretty much traversing Sandusky, Ohio on my bike. That's very photographic, that image. Yeah, I just actually got back from a 10-mile bike ride here in Three Rivers. Well, you look very refreshed. <laughs> I know, I'm very red. <laughs> who, who were your, um, what was your first aesthetic awakening as an artist? Well, I, I think that my, it, it really came from my family. Uh, my, my grandfather and father owned a company in Ohio called Opie Craft. And we uh, made novelty wood bass boxes and plaques for people to decoupage. And we also were partial owners of praying crayons and watercolors. So I grew up with an enormous amount of uh, craft uh, supplies around me. My uncle John's a painter. My aunt Sue uh, was, is a sculptor who both were in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. They moved a few years ago up to Portland, Oregon to be near my uh, uncle Jim, who's an expert on Middle Eastern tribal rugs. So I grew up in this family that was surrounded by artists and, and my dad took me to Toledo and Cleveland Art Museum all the time to have me look at paintings and talk about art, but it was predominantly between craft and also painting. But my grandfather did have a dark room in his basement in Ohio, and that started the love of photography for me. Who were your early influences when you were coming of age as a young artist? Well, I think that, you know, you and I are the same age. I think we were born around the same year, That's right. actually. And I think that one of the things that happened, especially in our generation of kind of growing up in America, is that you had the constant kind of picture magazines coming through your door. So you, you had Look, you had Life, you had National Geographic. And so you had this kind of wealth of documentary photography to look at and to think about in terms of how pictures were starting to make sense in relationship to storytelling. And so that would be the, the earliest influences of looking at images, but the largest influence of what made me decide to be um, a photographer was Lewis Hine. And it was wow. because of his photographs of the child laborers, um, especially the young girl in the, in the Carolina um, mill. I had to write a book report about child labor laws after I read this book. And instead I just wrote um, a very thorough description of the photograph and how the photograph was so much more meaningful for me than reading the statistics. I don't Do think I got a very good grade on that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I messed up on that assignment big time. <laughs> you feel that your artwork is autobiographical in any sense. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's moments where it's utterly autobiographical, then it's also, I don't know. I mean, I think it's hard for an artist not to be autobiographical. Yeah. I think that we work in these ways that um, in relationship to our own desire of communicating through images, 
that um, that ourselves are often the the first place of trying to answer those questions in relationship to the work that we begin to make. And I think that at moments I make work about my family at times or my community, which are utterly autobiographical, but then there's other moments in which I'm looking at the world. But I think that looking at the world has its own kind of specificity to um, uh, an American biography in, the t in, in terms of looking at this country and the times that I've lived in it and being a very political person. So I think that all of it in a certain way could be kind of talked about as autobiographical to a certain extent in, in terms of my interests. So maybe a related question, do you believe in photographic truth? Ah, oh boy, that's a hard one, right? I mean, I don't know, Greg, do you? Uh, you, you make up your stories. Um, I believe that a photograph is really, really potent in relationship to uh, um, the idea of, of catching a moment in time. And that I think that truth isn't as interesting to talk about as what history can do in relationship to us looking back at images. So truth is a sticky word for me. I've never been that interested in notions of truth because it feels like a kind of a puritanical relationship to ideas that could be, you know, really thought of from a history of religion in terms of the idea of how we think about truth. But I am interested in history and the idea of what representing different specific moments in time do to create a kind of a collective body of work in relationship to history. What is your, what do you feel the relationship, if any, photography has to voyeurism? Mm. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Um, you know, when I studied at San Francisco Art Institute, my teachers were, you know, Larry Salton and Hank Wessel and um, they, you know, so I, uh, and even John Collier, and even John Collier Jr., who was basically the one who uh, came up with visual anthropology as a terminology because his father, John Collier Sr., was a really well-known anthropo uh, anthropologist. I didn't say that right. I'm Ooh. stuttering. Let me drink. Um, <laughs> hydration. Hydration. Exactly. And... Um, <laughs> And so I think that, you know, I started out as a pretty um, hardcore street photographer in San Francisco. Yeah. And that kind of bearing witness, and that's another terminology that I like more so than truth, yeah. is this idea of bearing witness and what that is. Great term. Um, but what was, remind me of your question again, Greg, before <laughs> I like. Uh, the question is about voyeurism and its relation to photography. Ah, that's right. And street photography is utterly voyeuristic. Yeah. I mean, there is nothing but it as a voyeuristic kind of staple of photography. Um, so, you know, I think, I, I, I think uh, you know, the book that Mary did, Dirty Windows, is utterly about voyeurism that there is always a sense of voyeurism within uh, photography in terms of being invited in. And I think even my portraits to a certain extent are uh, voyeuristic for some people or titillating for some people. And I think that it kind of really depends on the viewer in terms of how they enter the work. Some viewers may enter the work in relationship to the fact that they're identifying themselves within the work and other people look at the work in terms of othering and I think that that's a really complicated thing that we all have to think about in terms of making images and I think at first I was a little naive and then I realized what an audience is mm -hmm. and kind of um, how to dance around that in a certain aspect but when you're making portraits there's nothing private about it once it goes out into the into world, the world. Yeah. yeah what is the least favorite part of the artistic process for you the least favorite i would say 
Huh. What is the least favorite? I mean, not, there's not that many things that I don't like about the artistic process. I'm, I'm happiest when I'm making photographs. Yeah. That's my favorite part of it. So I can answer that, that that is the utter most favorite part. The business aspect of the art world sometimes is not exactly how I wish it, you know, laid out or went down or different things that happen. So I think that even though I feel that I'm fairly competent in that business aspect of, of you know, my world, it's definitely not my favorite part. It's making the work and exploring that I love the most. How about when you're sort of in the post-production part of the process, whether it's in a dark room or printing? Well, I like that a lot. I mean, I now print predominantly, um, I used to print all my work up until I taught at Yale with you because I got pregnant and I couldn't print any anymore. So yeah. Wally Beshti printed the body of work 1999 for me while he was a student at Yale. And then Jeff Whetstone, who now teaches at Princeton, who was our student as well, yeah. He developed all my seven by 17 inch negative American cities because I couldn't be in a dark room because I was pregnant. And then literally after that, it kind of went to where I started having other people do that. But I still print everything in house like you do. And uh, I have one assistant who uh, does the post-production for me. Is there a movie or a work of art that changed your life? Hmm. A movie or a work of art. Or a book of some sort that like. I mean, it's so hard to always pinpoint one yeah. thing. It's like those questions that they ask you at the end of the interview and in kind of Harper's Bazaar or something like that. And That's what it's we're like doing here. Every, every, everything that I, I think that the, the biggest influence of a recent book is uh, an amazing book that I couldn't even pick up another book to read for about three months wow. because I had to sit within that story. And it's called The Overstory. Wow, and tell, tell us why. Um, because it really talked about the, rela the how nature communicates and especially in terms of trees and- wow. I think that I'm really been interested in the kind of politics around our environment. And I, you know, my, my partner is a really amazing gardener and nature lover. And she's brought that a lot to my life more so than me just being this urban dweller. Julie's brought kind of the love of really looking closely at nature. And that book is, just slays you in all these different ways in the characters. And it's a journey and you come out a little differently and you come out with a lot more respect for trees, actually, as I'm sitting here with trees around me. <laughs> but it really is, a, it really, really is a beautiful, beautiful book. And so I never really have a favorite movie or a favorite book. I would have to say that it's always, I'm always within the moment of what's influencing me and what I'm reading. I'm reading The Roundhouse right now. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certain books that just, I can't even pick up another book for a while because they're so incredible that I have to kind of live in that space. Yeah. Who is your imagined audience? I don't ever imagine an audience, actually, because I realized that you can't do that. I mean, after, I think that at first you think that you'll have an audience when you're an art student, you think like, oh, you know, somebody will look at this and they'll know what I'm thinking about and this and that. And then as you make work through the years, you realize that the audience is completely shifting. And like I said a little bit earlier, every once in a while you can kind of grab a hold of somebody and really influence them or they appreciate what you're putting out into the world and they can recognize it from these different levels. But to think about specifically a certain audience, no, I, I can't think of one and nor do I work, make work in that way. 
So, Kathy, you've made so many different kinds of bodies of work. It's one of sort of your hallmarks in terms of how you're, there's a restlessness to your pictures. But I'm curious whether or not you see like a through line in terms of everything you made in terms of certain central themes or preoccupations. Yeah, I mean, I would say that there's a through line for me. And I think that the through line is um, the relationship of photography as a document. Yes. The idea of what documentary does, not necessarily photojournalism as documentary, but the kind of ideas of what it is to record and bear witness and create histories throughout your various bodies of work. That's definitely a through line. Community is always a through line. And I would say that both, that I look at both the environment and the body as places of architecture, so to speak. And so that that is something that, you know, when I'm photographing like a Beverly Hills or Bel Air house, for me, the kind of way that the different periods of architecture are made in those specific houses are about borrowing from a history of architecture in the same way that my friends within my queer community borrowed from a history of tribal body modification. Yeah. and that it began to create a, a sense of architecture on their own bodies. And so between portraiture and, and looking at place are the main through fares through all the bodies of work. Great answer. What, um, is there a work of art or a movie or a book again that made, <laughs> that made you cry, that has made you cry? Well, Julie's in the background cooking and she'll probably laugh at this question, what makes me cry? Because everything makes me cry. Yes. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a bit of a weeper. I'm the person that all of a sudden Julie's like looks over at me and she goes, did that commercial make you cry? <laughs> and I'll be like, yeah, I think it just did. It choked <laughs> me up a little bit. <laughs> so I think I'm a little bit of a weeper, you know, at times, but, um, I mean, yeah, I think weeping is good. And then, of course, when you fly and you watch, you know, you're watching back to back movies on the plane, you, I mean, how come you're on the plane? You know what? You always I have to say, Jim Harris just said this very same thing in, in this, in the, in our last one. And we we're, yeah. that there's something about the plane. Maybe it's the altitude or something. I don't know. Or the idea that you're kind of giving your life over to this machine that could like make it or not make it <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know <laughs> interesting so, so how has success affected your work or mm. i don't know it's made me kind of jig and jag a little bit more i suppose <laughs> every time people want to settle down and think that they know what i'm going to make i like to kind of uh you know, have them make a U-turn or a left turn. I, I like to have the ability of to go through all the various ideas that I'm trying to do in relationship to making work and allow the audience uh, to all of a sudden uh, follow along with me when I make a different turn and, and see how that responds. So I think in a certain way, success has not only given me the privilege of continuing to work as an artist but that it's also given me an enormous amount of challenges as an artist to um up my own ability with every show that i try to put out there and what have you learned from through failure Patience, yes. perseverance are the two things that I've learned from failure that, you know, it's, it's like, okay, you've got to try this. That didn't work. You came home, all your film, for some reason, your card that you were shooting with is all blank. Even though you formatted it right and you did everything right, you just went on this major trip. You came home, you gave it to your assistant, and there's nothing there. 
And uh, then it's like, okay, well those, you know, and I, you, you think like, oh God, I remember this picture, this light, this everything. I waited like four hours to make this one image. And you're so excited about seeing it in your head and then it's not there. And then you just realize, okay, well that moment's gone now. I won't ever have that moment again, but I'll just go and I'll find the next moment and the next and try to, you know, persevere. I think perseverance is a really important quality to have as an artist. Tell us more about that. Just. Well, I think that, you know, it's funny. Like I remember being on a panel years ago with Judy Fiskin yeah. and it was with a critic and uh, we were on this panel and we were just talking about um, being art. And the critic says, well, I don't understand why it's called artwork. Like, there's no reason for it to be artwork. Don't you guys just play all the time? Like, isn't it, shouldn't it be called art play? And Judy and I looked at this, we looked at him and we were like, are you kidding me? Do you know what it's like to stand in a dark room for eight hours over a tray of stop bath trying to make the most, you know, in fixer, trying to make the most beautiful, uh, successful print that you could make? And I think that perseverance is a really important aspect because I think to the world, sometimes it looks really easy what we do. I have friends tell me all the time, you know, like, oh, like photography is really easy. And then I, you know, I had a recent friend who was going on a trip and I said, well, let me give you some gear so you can take pictures because it's, it's a really special place that you're going. And then, you know, I gave her a lesson and everything on the camera and told her how to work it and try to explain depth of field and all of that. And um, she, uh, she came back going, it's really hard making a good photograph. Yes. And I was like, yeah, it is. And that's the other aspect of perseverance is that we might put something out there in the world that looks fairly not complicated, except for you, Greg. Oh. <laughs> Your work is incredibly complicated. But, but you put something out there in the world that looks like, oh yeah, I could go and I could make that. Um, in the same way that people, you hear people taking their kids through museums saying, I don't understand that, I could make that. Uh, but it's, it's not about that. It's about the years and years and years of of dedication and that perseverance that allows you to continue to try to make something that's always pushing yourself as an artist. Do you have any thoughts about the fact that most of the world now sees pictures through screens and not as a physical object on the wall? Well, that's something that I was kind of playing with with the last that the shows up right now, but obviously the doors are closed at Regan Projects. You can see the installation online if you go to Regan Projects. You won't be able to play the video, but I use these oversized uh, mall monitors oh. that you see in malls now, these kiosks as video monitors. And I made stop motion political collages out of magazine cutouts. So and then with it are a series of swamps. It's called Rhetorical Landscapes, the exhibition. So there are these very still quiet photographs of swamps that are absolutely pristine within these video monitors that talk about the current state of politics under a Trump administration of um, of the you know comes out with a hand-painted grid and then slowly the magazine images make these different themes through guns immigration all the things that we've been exploring under the Trump administration. So my last show did deal with the screen as well as the modernist in a certain way tried to deal with the idea of the screen as well. And I think it is really prevalent. And um, I think that is, it's so interesting now in terms of this isolation that we're experiencing. And you all who are here with us are experiencing us through a screen, which isn't usually how we experience a lecture or meeting up and I don't know I think it's going to give us a lot to talk about for a really long time and how it changes what we make is going to be fascinating. I absolutely agree. What role does teaching play in your practice? Mm. It plays a role in terms of what mentorship means. 
Mm. Um, I like mentoring. I've been teaching now for 30 years. Yeah. Um, I would say that I like to teach from a basis of not me as an artist, that I'm more interested in teaching from what's being brought before me and looking at it and considering it. Um, I like being helpful um, as, as well as critical. Um, I, 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 I think that teaching hasn't necessarily informed my own work, but it's kept me up to date. It's, I'm not in just the studio hole of my own life. And I appreciate that because community is so important for me in terms of my own work, that teaching also provides that community aspect of mentorship that I feel I had great teachers and I appreciate that I try to be as, as good of a teacher as I can be with my own students. Uh, what is your favorite guilty pleasure? <laughs> um, uh, vanilla ice cream with chocolate sauce. <laughs> Yeah, that, and people can go off on that of whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. A little vanilla with a little swirl. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> what, what is your greatest fear? Uh, suffocation. Wow. Uh, claustrophobia, suffocation. Wow. Yeah. yeah super super tight spaces um i can't have covers over my head um if any you know anybody tries to put things that's why in the portrait pervert it was yes. super brave of me to put the mask and the leather hood on yes. because that was also dealing with one of my greatest fears and to make that self-portrait it had it dealt with a lot of different levels of fear as well as kind of politics and beauty and history in my own kind of little subculture. But yeah, my, suffocate. That's a, so my very last, my final question is, what advice would you give students in this moment of peril? Hmm. Hard one. I think everybody's looking for advice. I think that the most important thing to remember is that the whole world is going through this. Yeah. That it's not an isolated moment that this is happening to you. And I think that we are often a too solipsistic as a culture. And I think that if anything, maybe we're going to understand in this time period, especially having this president that we have right now, that we're going to understand a little bit more about humanity and kindness and what it means for us to reach out in a different way and make an impact in different ways. And that can be from just helping to making your own art to all of these things, but to incorporate that more of a philosophy in life versus this is just happening to you, um, I think is a really important thing to go forward with right now is that this is, this is not just an individual tragedy it's um it's a you know it, it's a virus and it's a pandemic and it's global yes well with that kathy i'm going to ask all the students to turn on their video and um their sound so you can see everyone oh hey everybody do you see it look at that i'm going to go to a bigger screen here let's see the whole screen view so i can scroll you all How's that? Amazing, huh? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, Julie Tolentino and Pigpen. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Look at that. Ah, oh, there's some friends in here. That's nice. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, it's kind of incredible. We have time for a few more questions if anybody wants to ask. Yeah, go for it. Anybody have a question for me? Don't be shy. Be shy. Mickey, you must have a question. <laughs> oh, 
I'm being called out. Okay. Um, I didn't have one necessarily prepared, but I guess I'll just ask now. Um, um, sometimes I think, I guess I'd say what would be your advice, if any, um, do you have for people making work, um, dealing with um, issues that, that are new to them? Um, or, yeah, I guess like how, when do you feel compelled enough to start creating work about something? I mean, that's it, it, a really good question, Mickey. I think that one of the ways that I always talk to my students about is um, in, in terms of making work, what are the questions that you're trying to answer? And you kind of make work through getting to a place that you feel like you've answered that question. Because I, don't, I think that some of us work intuitively, some of us work very conceptually. There's all of these different kind of modes of making work, but I think that all work uh, always comes from a, a place of exploration and trying to answer a specific question that we might be exploring. So, and the other thing is, is if you feel like you don't answer the question and you're not moving it forward, then you're just not working through it enough and that you shouldn't throw it away. That you have to work through all the problems and that's that perseverance again that I'm talking about. Great, thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Hi, I, uh, for Sheer Photo, my name is Nabil, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Um, Thank you. I was wondering if you could talk, yeah, um, I was wondering if you could talk more about the role of fear, like you talked about it specifically with that one self-portrait that you made, like how much and to what extent is that a part of like your process? I don't think it's that much of part of my process because I try very hard not to live in fear. Um, I find that it's stifling living in fear. And I think that fear is, a, is actually something that could be provocative in exploring in work. And then as you explore it, then that fear begins to subside to a certain extent. I still don't like things over my head. I mean, that's never going to go away. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I think that, I think it's interesting because not to go to a psycho kind of therapist uh, place, but art often is that place where we're dealing with our most intimate um, issues, so to speak. And I think that fear is a really curious place to begin to make work to also get through things. Um, and we do it in all these different ways and some of it might be private. I have an enormous amount of work that is private that will never be public. And that's another thing that all of you should remember as an artist that not everything needs to be public. When I made Pervert, I wasn't really in the art world yet. I mean, the first place that that piece showed was the 1995 Whitney Biennial. And I had to go home to my parents in Poway, California, and show them the picture and tell them, by the way, this is going to hang in the Whitney Museum of American Art. And I just need you to know that not only am I a lesbian, but I'm also a leather dyke. And you might have some questions about that. And I'd like to explain that to you. <laughs> So he, I made that image in a very tight knit community that, you know, that I felt completely safe with in terms of expressing it. When it went out into the world, it was a really different thing for me. And I think there was a reason why all of a sudden you saw my work shift from those portraits, those portraits that everybody talk about in the 90s, to making freeways and going back out into the world to photograph. And partly it was not the fear of myself in relationship to making the work, but actually the fear of people's interpretation of the work and then how it created perceptions about myself as a human being. And so reporters would say, oh, I was so scared to meet you or talk to you. And I would be like, well, why? 
you know and i think that that's an interesting thing too is like um this idea that you live on this kind of edge in a certain way when i'm actually if anybody really knows me that well i'm not that edgy uh, <laughs> you know maybe maybe some people think i was but not really i mean i but it's so interesting again like the audience like what greg was talking about with the audience but the perception of that was really hard for me to live with as well as I would say another huge uh, idea of fear in my life that I've always worked on and challenged is uh, homophobia. So most of the work that I've done within my queer community is because I actually, again, wanted to create work that created a history about identity and my own identity. But I had this immense fear in making that work that I was never going to get a teaching job that I was never gonna be able to like talk to my parents in this certain way again, or what it meant to come out in that way. And so there's all these different things that fear might be able to lock us up where we can't create, but then if we actually just go ahead and push our way through it, then we open up all these other possibilities of creating a, a conversation and a discourse. Totally, thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> Any final questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, I want to know um, what's the role, like when you become a mother, what's the difference between you know, become a mother and uh, before? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, being a mom is like one of the greatest things that I've ever been able to do in my life. Uh, my son is back in his bedroom now, he's 18. He's in his senior year of high school. Greg remembers when I got pregnant up at Yale when I was teaching there and now we're 18 years past that and um, and it's hard work but it's I, I you know I never didn't want to have kids. My whole entire life was me thinking about wanting to be a mother and so it's uh, it's hard work and it's utterly joyful as well and fascinating and it's the most complicated relationship you could ever have in your life in my mind be nice to your mothers <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> anyone else um i had a question just about like the times now because you had mentioned you know uh documentary photography and bearing witness to history i find it difficult to want to capture the pandemic right now and then not being able to leave my house. So is there anything that you are doing at home that's like, you know, a new process for you with photography, kind of just all of us being confined to, to your homes? Is there anything that you're specifically exploring right now? Yeah, I'm taking some still lives, uh, you know, with my iPhone uh, for the most part. I have a camera up here. Um, when I was in LA before we came up to our house, I thought that I would photograph LA and it was really interesting. I did an interview with somebody and I think it was published, I forget where it was, but one of the things with my body of work American cities is that I was shooting with a seven by 17 inch banquet camera and all of the cities were empty, which is what we're experiencing now. And that uh, interviewer asked, why are you gonna go out and photograph cities? And I said, no, I mean, my challenge was that I actually, it was hard for me to, you know, wait and get them empty. And I could basically only be an early morning Sunday photographer. That's what that body of work was. And to go out and photograph these empty spaces now has a completely different meaning. Mm -hmm. So my answer to you would be figure out what is interesting to investigate and if that's even making drawings of the photographs that you want to make um, then that's another way that you're kind of dealing with what you're going through in your mind I'm I'm up here I'm drawing I'm painting I'm riding my bike um, I'm taking photographs with my cell phone and I'm journaling I'm writing every day and I think because I didn't want to rem I didn't want to not remember this time because I mean none of us have ever gone through this. I mean I've you know I'm going to be 59 next week and I've never seen the world shut down before. None of us have. And 
neither has my mother, you know, who's 84, um, who's healthy, thank goodness. Uh, but I think that all, anything that you can do that in relationship to creativity that might be also out of your norm right now of the way that you usually create is actually still being creative. And it's gonna give you different informations into when we open up again, what will come out of this is gonna be really fascinating. Right. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Thank sure. you. I have a uh, question. My name's Alex. I'm a first year PhD student. Um, Hi. Quick anecdote and then leads to the question. Last time I saw you speak was at the Whitney for your Annenberg lecture, um, which was really great. And I knew I had to come and hear you speak again. And I was sitting in the audience for that talk and you showed pervert. And I don't know if you know that this happened, but um, I was sort of sort of towards the front and looked to the left and there was sort of a lot of commotion and then um, oh a woman fainted a woman a woman threw up oh, <laughs> she had a, visceral, a visceral response to the photograph oh wow it was really i've had people faint but i don't remember somebody throwing up that's funny because i was that was when i was talking with adam right with adam and we were towards the front but it was kind of to the side so anyway, so then the person came and cleaned, she left, a person came and cleaned. I think it was probably had to do with the bloodletting or the needle, but um, person came and cleaned. <laughs> and then the, person Sorry, came, the person came back and watched the rest of your lecture. So I knew it was, you know, you're giving a good lecture when somebody has that response and then can't leave. Sorry, when they do, yeah, can they come, come back? back? Yeah, 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 I guess you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> I'm so Gone. jealous, Kathy. But I'm, curious about, like, <laughs> <have anybody puked? laughs> I'm curious about uh, like visceral responses to artwork. Have you mm -hmm. had a visceral response to an artwork that feels particularly memorable yeah. or noteworthy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was in San Francisco um, at uh, the Art Institute in 80, 1983, I would go to Jeffrey Frankel all the time, Frankel Gallery. And I would ask him to pull out Maplethorpe's X portfolio for me. Mm. And at that point in time, the portfolio was like $1,200 to buy. And I remember wanting to really buy it. And I was still trying to explore my own relationship to uh, the S&M community. And, you know, I was obviously a photographer and Maplethorpe was somebody that we all talked about. But he was, he was, it was that, it was that portfolio specifically that... I had to keep looking at it because I couldn't believe the things that I was seeing in that were done in that kind of formal aesthetic precision that Maplethorpe brought to work. And um, yeah, Jeffrey kept saying to me, you're gonna make me pull it out again, Kathy? And I was like, yeah, I just, I'm sorry, I have to look at it again. <laughs> you know? And I remember going like, God, I wish I had $1,200 to buy it. But, you know, I was a broke art student working from 3 to 8 in the morning as a front desk clerk for my room and board and then a job at a motel, a seedy motel afterwards as well. So, um, yeah, there was no buying Maplethorpe portfolios at that moment. Thank you. One last question. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Del. Uh, so I had a... Hi. Hi. I had a question. Um, hello. So I personally, I fall back on art making and like, you know, photography and painting as a form to like kind of nurture and take care of my anxieties and the stuff that I find overwhelming, you know, to confront what makes me vulnerable. But I don't know, sometimes that itself, like the art making process itself becomes overwhelming and anxiety producing. And I was curious as to whether or not that is something that has ever happened to you and like what have you done to um kind of take care of yourself in those moments and just get yourself back on your feet you know i think that you know a lot of times when i'm feeling anxiety i turn to actually moving my body and so uh swimming is a huge part of my life as well i can't swim up here Greg, you're a big swimmer. We always shared swimming together. Um, you introduced me and I think to, that, huh? You introduced me to Diana Nyad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, who's on Facebook Live every day too, giving tips to people. So, she is? yeah, yeah, wow. you can find her on Facebook. She does a live thing every day. So, um, but I think that I think that one of the things for anxiety is, yeah, work will do a certain thing on a mental level for you, but you actually have to create some kind of physicality for your endorphins in your body. And that that's really important in times like this too, especially when we can't leave our homes or we don't feel that it's safe to leave our homes. Like my son the other day, he was just like, look, I'm going to download Just Dance and we're all going to have a dance party together. Mm -hmm. And that is like another way of dealing with something is just like turning on music and just like, you know. I don't know, pretend that you're in a mosh pit at a, at a concert and just flail your body around for a little bit. But I'm, a, I'm kind of a big believer in exercise for anxiety versus necessarily making art. Greg, you're nodding too. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, my final question is what's for dinner tonight? I don't know what Julie's doing over there. Um, we might have beans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I might take the chili out of the freezer because maybe I want some chili tonight. Last night we had an amazing sweet potato soup uh, with uh, home baked biscuits and a and an arugula salad. And so I don't know what's on the menu tonight, but I'll uh, yeah. There's a lot of cooking as it is going on with everybody right now. It's it's interesting. So. Interesting moment. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for this. It's so generous of you and so interesting and filled with your wisdom. 